Hello, welcome to Bigger Truth Podcast. I'm Scott McMahon, and I have Forrest Woodwick here, um, and we are uh, we're, we're going to talk about uh, Maricopa County and LD Legislative District 26 in Arizona. And uh, in just a brief overview, if you're not in Arizona, Maricopa County has 65 percent, uh, roughly, of all of the voters in the entire state. It's a huge county. And there are 20 legislative districts or LDs within the, the borders of the county. Maricopa County is, uh, as I've begun to cover in my reports and in, in, in our last podcast, Maricopa County is primarily dominated by disruptors. And when I say disruptors, what I mean is people who uh, tend to have more of an interest in control and power, and they use uh, tactics of Saul Alinsky and the far left, and they really don't seem to be interested in winning in November. And they, there are, they, they engage in uh, centur censuring uh, PCs or precinct committeemen or, or delegates in other states. Um, in Arizona, they're called precinct, precinct committeemen or PCs. And there, so there's censures, there's removals, there's a lot of kind of power games from them. There's threats, there's very abusive language. Uh, they, they yell and scream. And in Arizona, the disruptors, they seem to be, <laughs> from the video footage that I've watched and from the way that they speak to uh, people that aren't in their cult or their group, uh, it, they are... Uh, you know, very, very, very abusive. I mean, they, they call them demons and Satan, and uh, they they pray, uh, and they and even at the meetings they'll they'll pray, and and in the prayer they will accuse everyone else there of being demons uh, that you know that are in the group. It's uh, a very hostile environment that they create. That's very contradictory <laughs> of of really what the Republican Party should stand for. Um, and so I'm really glad to have you here today, Forrest, and we're going to, I, I want to start, I want to start by just kind of giving an overview of your story. And if you're watching this live, encourage your questions, bring your questions and comments, and we'd love to respond to those even as we go. Um, we're really glad that you're here. So Forrest, you started in, as you were telling me, uh, in our previous conversations that you started as chair in, you became the chair of LD26 in November of 22. Is that right? That's correct. And uh, thank you very much for inviting me here too, Scott. Yeah, uh, you're welcome. Don't, don't have much opportunity to, to talk about this stuff and get the word out. Mm -hmm. so, yes. Yeah. And yeah, I had the conditions under which I was put into the, or became the chairman was uh, uh, Timothy, uh, Schwartz was a previous chairman. He stepped down and uh, and put me in as uh, in his place and he went to the first vice chair position. And so from that, he has told people that he gifted the chairmanship to me. So he he became a, his expectation was that he would mentor me through everything, even though I told him I would not do things the way he had done them. So our relationship got off to a rocky start early in in uh, January uh, related to a PC he wanted to get removed. And we, we had strong disagreements about that. And also, the, his mentoring style also was, was one of more like do, do what I tell you to do. And if I didn't do what he told me to do or didn't follow his instructions, uh, typically, uh, if I made a mistake, and then he would kind of berate me for the mistake, never explaining what I did wrong or why it was wrong. Uh, and the other thing he added to that was telling me about all the bad people to avoid, never telling me anything about them, just they're bad people, stay away from them. That is a huge, huge thing in every state. That's one of the first things that they do. Um, and in it, here in Michigan, there was kind of the lead shadow operator. His name is Mike Labity, and that would be the first thing that you would tell people. And they're very starting in the first conversation. There's enemies all around, and and he he would start with the enemies list. You got to watch out for this person. You got to watch out for that person. You know they're 
they'll stab you in the back or whatever, just avoid them. Uh, be, and you know, people would ultimately find out that the reason why they didn't want him, he didn't want them to talk to them was because, well, their, their opinions diff <laughs> differed from his, that they, you know, that they would be exposed to a narrative that was contrary or something that was contrary to the narrative that they've been fed. And so is that kind of, it sounds like that's the same experience that you had there. Yes, I would say so. And of course, I, I, my personality is such that I, I have to find out on my own uh, about people. I don't, I don't, I guess maybe it's, I don't trust what other people say. I'd like to find out for myself because you, I've heard too many, had, I've been wrong too many times listening to other people say somebody's bad or somebody's good. So I do it on my own. And uh, Timothy didn't like that. Um, but uh, we had a conversation on the way home from one of the EGC meetings, which is the executive guidance committee for those who aren't aware of that. And on the way home, he, uh, we were talking about this very subject about good guys and bad guys. And then when I told him I do it on my own, do my own thing, he said, he gave me this analogy. Did your mother not tell you, ever tell you not to touch the hot stove? And so I didn't understand the, the, the re reasoning for that. It, it seemed kind of a strange comment. So he said, that's what he was doing for me. He's telling me about these bad people because they're like the hot stoves. Don't touch them. So anyway. Just so condescending. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, and, I, that, yeah, that's that's wild. Um, yeah, and the rest of the trip was uh, we drove in silence. Uh, sure. You know, uh, and so you, he, he has a relationship with Brian Ferentz, right? Is that... Yeah, as far as I know, they're they're really good friends. Yeah, and Brian Ferentz is not in your district. He's in LD three, but he he is kind of notorious, and I've I've written about him before, both on Twitter posts and and in my last report on the on multiple states. That he's he is one of the kind of cultural leaders, perhaps of the of the disruptor movement in Maricopa County. And he is he, his behavior is really beyond the pale. He actually sent out an email just today that I received, and I, I haven't written about it yet. But he sent out an email saying that that Candace Zardi, who's the chair of LD three, that she was never even elected to chair of LD three, and that's just uh, that's such a bald faced lie. I mean, she she very clearly was elected to as as chair of ld3 and uh I'll, I'll look at having candace and i've been talking about doing a podcast at some point in the future to talk about that more but uh so he 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 says really deliberately the opposite of the truth very consistently and um yeah. and that's just an example of it but and and his behavior is is i mean he's yelled and screams and uh accuses people of assaulting them um he's done that with multiple people uh and, you know just for you know creating a situation where they kind of have to touch them to get past them or then he calls it assault and calls the police and you know that kind of thing um, yeah. so all right so so there is a connection yeah. then with between him he's not just timothy's not just kind of a lone wolf this isn't just like his own personality defects that he's expressing against you no right i, I would say no and and brian ferris has probably been uh, a an attack dog for timothy in some respects on Twitter, anyway, our ex. I've been on there a few times and and said some things, made comments, and every response to me from Brian Ferentz was an ad hominem attack. Uh, he has called me a rhino, an establishment, a Democrat, a Marxist. He's called me all that stuff, and uh, he's and so I, yeah, he 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 does not argue or present rational arguments when he's dealing with people on on uh, social media it's always right. those kinds of attacks yeah right okay so then you after after four or five months of dealing with timothy in this way and that kind of just uh you, you also said that he came to your house unannounced at one point what? no several times that is his, his that's his mo he does that to all a lot of the pcs he just drops in usually it with other PCs, he does it because he has some kind of business he wants to transact at a meeting or a vote where he needs their vote or needs their proxy. So he drops in and tries to get that from them. And uh, he will be very persistent in that activity, trying to get them to side with him and explain you know, what he wants done and try to get them to do his bidding. 
But when I was chairman, he stopped in regularly to talk to me about things. Um, I didn't expect that to happen, never announced. And uh, there was one time he stopped, in, um, most of my wife would hear these conversations and she would just be amazed at uh, the, the tenor of them because he would get heated, I would get heated and we'd have these uh, uh, discussions. One of them, that, one that really threw me though was that he sat down across my dining room table with me and he looked at me and he says, there's one thing about you that, that it's kind of disturbing. He says, you've never shown any gratitude. And so I'm just sitting there shaking my head. I don't know where he's going with this, but he says, but he says to me, you know, I, I gifted you my baby. I think he said, actually, I gave you my baby and you never once thanked me for it. And what he meant by his baby was the LD. He gave me the chairmanship. So he gave me his baby and I didn't thank so him. It belonged to him. It belonged to him. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Yeah. Wow. And that's, that's, yeah. So that's why he probably came over and was beating me over the head with things frequently because he wanted me to treat his baby the way he would. I, there were times when I was tempted to tell him, hey, do you know that your baby loves me more than you? you know, <laughs> that's what's happening. Uh, but I never did say that to him. So, so, but yeah. so you yeah. ended up resigning in submitting a resignation. You just got fed up with it, right? In yeah. by March of, of last year. Yeah. And, and so you resigned and then and then what happened? Uh, after I resigned, I got asked by several LD chairmen to undo it, to take back my resignation. My PCs, several of my PCs wanted me to take back my resignation. And uh, Shelby Bush was another one who said that I should take it back. And she gave me some hints on things I could do. Hmm. And then I, I followed that up. I followed up with, uh, I got a recommendation to an attorney because I wasn't quite sure how this would work right, or if I could do it. And it turns out through Robert's rules, if you, the body is supposed to accept your resignation in order for it to be final. Since they hadn't done that, uh, I would never was, uh, I had never left the chair. I was always been the chairman. So that happened. So uh, I, I don't imagine that Timothy was happy about that. Uh, he was livid, let's put it that way. And he demonstrated that with an email on March 28th. I got cemented in my mind where he came came out and he uh, spewed a bunch of falsehoods about me personally, defamed me, uh, and told some uh, false things about Chairman Berlin, the things Chairman Berlin apparently said to me when I quizzed him about it. He said, no, I never said that. So Timothy said a lot of things uh, and, and just made, uh, trying to make me look bad to the PCs. He closed off the email with a, a cease and desist order issued by him in the email with all these conditions attached. And I was not supposed to con have any contact with any of the PCs and send them emails or anything like that. Okay, so this was not a cease and desist order. This was just a cease and desist email. This was a command, not by a judge, but just by him. He was saying, this is what you have to do by my authority. Yes, it's like... And when I researched it a little bit, it's like he was he was um, actually impersonating a judge by writing it that way as right. a just cease and desist order, because they're the only ones who can issue a cease and desist order. Sure. Yeah. And then he followed that up with uh, uh, what a, a monitoring program. He has a he has a few devoted PCs in his is uh, in his purview or his clan or whatever you want to call it. And they will tell him anything. They'll watch out for him. And stuff, and so they they told him when I violated his cease and desist order, and he sent me text messages then telling me I violated. And those text messages, um, he went on to say, if I did not, yeah, go yeah. down there in the blue. Um, hang on a second yeah. here. Yeah. Yeah. So that's this page, right? And this is really small, so I'm going to read it. Which ones? Um. So he said, um, he said right here, all complaints from LD26 members are being compiled and will be forwarded to our attorney, uh, whoever that is. And uh, yeah. he accused you, he said, he said to you, 
And this was in an email to to the whole body or what? Oh, this is a text message to me. There's a text message to me saying, but you're unstable and I refuse to allow you to pull me into your darkness. Yes. <laughs> uh, he says right here that for a cease and desist is not a suggestion. It's an order. I know you think you're being clever to ignore the warning, but after two violations, you're about to learn a hard lesson. Legal friends have been contacted. So not legal attorneys, legal friends, yeah. whatever that is. And we'll assist if you continue. You're not authorized to send email to our members. Your persistence is a violation of our bylaws. So I'm, I'm not sure which bylaws um, yeah. it violates to actually be in contact for for the chair to be in contact with the with the uh, pcs so right. um this is i mean this is pretty beyond the pale i mean you're you're also losing support of many members because they're you know but really i would imagine that that his behavior if anything turned people off yes i actually got an email from a a, a pc that i had never spoken to at that time and she said, uh, this sounds like the ranting of a five-year-old. And she said, she compared it with an email I had done before. And she says, your emails are, you know, it's like a thought, thought out, well thought out and presented and stuff. But this is like some tantrum that somebody is writing this stuff. Mm -hmm. And I was shocked by that. Melanie, that Melanie Greenfield. And uh, so, you know, Forrest, Melanie is, uh, she was a, District Vice Chair, uh, you might have seen at, uh, on a previous podcast, she was a District Vice, Vice Chair in District 1 who was removed. Uh, but uh, she, in, in a really sham kind of a show trial, she says cease and desist orders are common tools of the cult members. Um, and yeah, that, that's something that we have seen. Um, you know, that they, they try to use any sort of threat that they can in order just to control people. So, um, right. So then they, so he had in, in Arizona, they, they really seem to use appointed PCs a lot. Is that right? Like they really tried to appoint PCs into the position and that they can control. And it sounds like he, he was able to, to gather a kind of a, a small posse of appointed PCs that he, he said he was keeping them from you. Can you explain that? Yeah. Uh, so yeah, in the odd numbered years, we can appoint PCs and even number of years they get elected. So, and what's interesting is as the first vice chair, one of his duties is to recruit PCs according to the bylaws. And he had not recruited any PCs for the year up until October. And in October, I, as a chairman, I received the applications. I got 40 applications uh, sent to me from the Maricopa County uh, Republican Committee uh, via the chairman, 40 applications in three days. And wow. under, under the bylaws, you have 15 days to to review those and make a decision. So I, I started on that right away. I called two people, I think the day or day after I got those. Uh, one, <clears throat> one shut me down pretty quick because uh, she was going somewhere. Another one I talked to, and I'm curious, where the where I was curious as to where these applications come from because there's a lot of different sources. It could be like TPUSA or some other organization. It could be some PCs. So I didn't know the source of them. And, I, and it's like somebody who does marketing. They want to know how their message got got to the person. Sure. And when I asked this woman, she she was hesitant to kind of answer, and and I <clears throat> she finally admitted it was a, a gentleman. And she didn't remember his name. Okay, yeah, she didn't remember his name. But the next day, the next day, Timothy, next day or two days later, Timothy sent me an email. He had sent out to the entire EGC, uh, describing what happened. And so, so she didn't know who it was. But anyway, the the she was being untruthful with you. Uh, I think she was being guarded. Okay. Yeah, as I found out later, the uh, when I tried to contact these people, I got a hold of three people. She was one of them. And I talked to uh, two others, actually three others, and was able to have conversations with them. I found out later, about a week later, that um, it wasn't even that long, that he had told them not to have any communication with me. No, don't receive any uh, phone calls, texts, emails, nothing from me. So I, I 
called everybody the following Saturday. So I got the applications like on a Monday or Tuesday or something like that. And then I called everybody on Saturday that was on the list. And I talked to one person, left messages for the rest. And then on Monday, I get a, I have a telephone conversation with Timothy and he says, he says, I know you try to call all these people, all these people all weekend all over the weekend, but you're not going to get to talk to them. You, the only way you're going to get to talk to them is by a method that I will tell you. And then he went on to describe that I would be able to meet with them in groups of 13 at a Denny's and vet them. That's what his word, vet them at the Denny's. And he ended by saying uh, he ran this plan across, across uh, Chairman Berlin. Chairman Berlin thought it was a good plan, and he, he said he recommended we go forward with it. And, and so uh, Chair, Chairman Berlin is Craig Berlin, who is the MCRC, the Maricopa County Republican Committee chair. Yes, exactly. Yeah. That's who he is. So he, uh, and he also told me, and Timothy told me that if I did not approve them, that Chairman Berlin told him he would. So you can what imagine, authority does he have to approve LDPCs? Excuse me? What what authority would he have? You know, does do the bylaws permit that? No. Under state statute, he he sends a list to the county board of supervisors for them to do the final appointment of PCs. Okay. So he he puts that link in there. The county chair can do that. The county chair does that. To okay. say that that grants him the authority to approve PCs, um, I don't I don't read the statute that way. Right. People read our bylaws that way that he gets to approve if I don't. And it's a little bit of a convoluted bylaw, and I don't want to get into the details here. It just uh, it probably wouldn't make sense to people. Right. Okay. So, so what he's doing then is he he's given you this list of forty uh, PCs and saying that. I and mean, you have the the right to to deny them, right? I I thought I did because I denied uh, according to, I, I denied at least twenty because I never spoke to these people. I never had a chance to sure. vet these people. I mean, you're you're the chair, so you and, and I mean, even he said you you could vet them at Denny's <laughs> in groups of thirteen. Uh, so. You know, clearly, I mean, you have a responsibility to make sure that these are actually Republicans, right? Yeah. That, well, actually, they, that happens anyway with the the county will always check that. But I was checking that. In fact, there, there were some that came across uh, as unaffiliated. There were at least two of them. And uh, when I looked them up on the GOP data center and they went through and it's quite possible, they say the GOP data center is a little bit behind with their their data so i assume after that they got they were republicans but they hadn't been republicans real long but they still qualified interesting so sean says smash the like button skyla sa says uh, i'm grateful for this interview i am grateful that you're here um and so uh <laughs> so he's he's trying to prevent the chair from having access to these PCs that he has brought in. And I mean, you don't just put out a call and the next day you've got 40 PCs. And they're clearly, like you said, there, there was some, there, there was some significant marketing to produce this. He had to have been working and probably not alone for some amount of time in order to recruit these people. Yeah. He's a, uh, Timothy is, is uh, a master recruiter. Okay. He can go out and get people. I don't know how, how exactly what he does to get them convinced to come in. I know some of some stuff has come back to me, like a woman that he recruited this time said that she didn't know what she was signing up to do. She didn't know what she had signed, and she was tired of him stopping by her house all the time. So mm -hmm. she said, take me off the list. So I did. He lost five people within, I think, before they, they were even uh, approved as PCs through the county. Right. So, so you so you denied 20 of them, and I'm sure he wasn't happy about that. No. And so that made me look like the bad guy, and that's what he told them. As, as I've come to learn, he's told them that I rejected them. Sure. And uh, but in order to generate the 
victim story, the victim narrative. To yes, try. that just didn't, uh, you know, makes him look all the more like the hero in the story. Yep. So, and then after after he, he uh, they all got put on board, uh, courtesy of either Chairman Berland or the Treasurer Lawrence Hudson, who does a lot of the PC reviews and applications and stuff. One of them overrode and overrode my my uh, rejections. And there were two people I specifically requested not to for various reasons, for good reasons, and they put those through. They even put through uh, a PC instead of one that I had put forth. Uh, I, I put in a name, and because it wasn't somebody that Timothy had put in is my uh, assumption, because he didn't put him in, uh, then they rejected my my choice and put in the other guy that I said, said I was declining because the, there were no PC positions left in the in that precinct. So they can so they can deny the chair's choice, but the chair can't deny uh, you know Timothy's choice. Yes, uh, something like that. Once they have made their decision and it's gone down to the board of supervisors, once they have touched it yeah. and processed it, you're you're toast. You can't do anything. There's no recourse. I see. Yeah, because so. But then Timothy went on, he, he uh, held his own meetings with them. And in my, my parlance, he used that as a, a, a time to give them the information he wanted them to know uh, and to use that to tell them bad things about me. Because mm -hmm. I've heard since then that, that, that that's what, part of what was going on. I found out recently that I, I had Trump derangement, derangement syndrome. Mm. That at one of our meetings, somebody said that. I found out uh, from another person that I'm soft on abortion. And through a, a friend in another LD who knows one of these new PCs, uh, the new PC told her I was a horrible person. She had never met me, never talked to me or anything. And when mm -hmm. asked why she said I was a horrible person, she said, well, that's what they tell me. So, uh, you know, the saving grace is that, that there were a few people. That after talking to you? Pardon? That? Did she still believe that after talking to you, or did she just refuse to talk to you? She's resigning. Mm. Yeah, she's resigning. I took papers to her last week and uh, gave her papers because I was told she wanted she wanted out. She was tired of the fighting and the disruption. She didn't want to have anything to do it. She came to do work. Um, no, no. So I that's the only contact I had with her is at the door when I handed her resignation papers. It's really too bad. Yeah. So, uh, okay. So so this was. October and so now he's he's basically holding his kind of alternate LD is he is he telling them that he's the chair or like you know he's having this alternate meetings is he not allowing the, these people to come to the LD 26 meetings um, you know what's what's going on there so they didn't get approved until November 15th okay so and two days before that we we removed him as the first vice chair okay the body voted it, was, it took a two-thirds vote we got almost 75 percent of the, the those present voted uh to remove him oh wow. so he's 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 not that popular <laughs> people see through him that's why he needed to go out and recruit more people that's right he's, he's popular when he first signs them up and has can speak to them but once they find out the kind of leader he is then they're less inclined to listen to him that's what has happened to a lot of the current PCs who were signed up by him. The legacy PCs, I call them. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, so, so then we got from there to the, over the next four months to uh, it was uh, March second. Is that right? Well, the one other factor in there, if okay. I could quick, sure. uh, in because of what happened with the uh, Timothy worked with Brian Ferentz to produce a resolution to censure me at the EGC meeting in December. So this is the county EGC meeting. So yes. Okay. At that meeting, the the resolution stated that I had blocked 20 PCs. And when Brian Ferris gave his his uh, one minute debate, he said they were mega PCs. And <clears throat> I blocked 20 mega PCs, which yeah, I like I might read minds, Brian. I knew they were MAGA PCs because, yeah, I could just feel the vibe from them from, uh, you know, a great distance away. Right. Because and they then, wouldn't talk to you. You didn't have the opportunity to talk to them. Yeah, never spoken to them. 
Yeah. And, and that was a pattern part. from, from M MCRC, right? I and mean, they've, I've, I've heard that they've, they've really just been completely overzealous with the censures. Yeah. I was the fifth, uh, a fifth uh, chairman to be censured last year. Wow. Out of the 20 in the county. Out of the 20 in the county. Yeah. So they, they censured one quarter of the PCs in the entire county in one year. The LD chairman. The, L, the LD chairman. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Wow. So, and then, they, so they, they, there's a group that votes together on just about everything. Morgan Perry has done the statistics on that. And they were voted, or 16 have voted in lockstep on every everything except for one vote of the entire, entire year. And uh, after Shelby had said that she uh, supported me in coming back from my resignation on the censure, she voted, also voted uh, to have me censured. Wow. So, wow. Yeah. Two sides of the same mouth, I guess, huh? So, um, so that, and that was in December 5th. December. Okay. So then, uh, in the, between December and and March, did he continue just meeting? Yeah, so he, he was removed. He's no longer on the EC for the LD, right? No, he's not on the board. No. And so so he's off the board. So is is he still being the leader to these people? And yeah. Restricting their access to you or your access to your PCs? Yes. Uh, we had a LD meeting in January. And he, none of them showed up, as I recall. And I hope you're still there. You just went to. A, yeah, I am. I just need to fix my camera. You can keep talking. <laughs> and uh, and January, none of them showed up, but Timothy was there. And then in February, they he had a bunch of them show up because he had a motion he wanted to bring forward. He needed people to vote for him for that motion. He wasn't sure that, so they showed up for that meeting. But other than that, uh, that meeting they were there, and of course they were showed up for the March 4th meeting in which uh, they did the vote to remove the chairman. And then after, uh, after those meetings, uh, Timothy then had been going around with a petition. By, it was a bylaw, MCRC bylaw. It says that if you wanna remove a chairman, you have to get 50% of the PCs in that district to sign a petition asking the chairman of the MCRC to hold a meeting in which the a majority of the PCs present could remove the sitting chairman. So Timothy was out getting those petition signatures and uh, I came to find out, uh, well, I had the, the <clears throat> I found out about this when the, when Chairman Berlin sent out an email saying that there was a notice uh, of a meeting to calling for me, me to be removed. And I got that email, I think it was like February, I think 21st or something like that. And Timothy had turned in his petition on February 15th, as I learned later. So I had no idea. I had no forewarning, no phone call, nothing from Chairman Berlin saying this was coming. He just got dropped on me at the same time as everybody else. And in the uh, Doing research, found out that uh, Timothy had taken great pains to get those signatures, working very, very hard. And in the process, he he did things such as intimidating people to sign the petition. I have five people who said that they were they signed the petition against their will, essentially, because he just stood there and kept badgering them. And when that wasn't working, then he told them some false information about it saying that, yeah, if you sign this, then we'll have an opportunity to discuss the issues and resolve things in the LD. So, and he told that to some other people uh, as well. Uh, when I talked to some of the PCs that he had uh, kept to himself, they all thought, thought this was about an opportunity for, for them to learn about what the issues were and maybe get to some resolution. And I said, no, there's one guy said, no, that's not it at all. Read the petition. It said right at the top. There's only one thing this is about, and that's removing the chairman. So, yeah, he even he, he told one guy you could re, you could take back your signature if you want to later on. Right. After you've been removed. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. uh, so, you know, it is, you know, 
to some extent, it, it, it could be said that it's the fault of the PCs for not reading what they're signing. We're all accountable to, for what yeah. we sign. Exactly. Uh, but it still is, is clearly, you know, it's a, uh, <laughs> I, I, I think you could say pretty accurately that it was a pretty, by, by false pretenses. Yeah. Uh, you know, he was he was misrepresenting to people what what they were signing, and um, and so have they have, have those PCs taken any sort of action? Or I mean, yes, uh, uh, we have, we have one. Uh, we have a what's called an appeals committee. Okay, so the PCs can submit concerns that they have. One has filed has filed one uh, complaint. Another person is working on it. And then uh, the other one that's really interesting, we had two people who were approached by a PC that, that most assuredly was sent by Timothy to ask them for their resignations. And uh, they, they were told there would be two PCs, there were two PCs ready and waiting to take their place. And for some reason, they thought I had sent this guy. And the reason I sent him is because I had a couple of, you know, real ringers as PCs and I wanted to bring them in. So they thought they were being team players by taking a hit for the team and letting these other better, more involved, perhaps PCs get, um, take over. So, so they got duped out when they found out that that was not the case, they were livid. They, they took some action to try and get back. They had to reapply as appointed PCs to get back in. That's still ongoing. Wow. Wow. Um, so why Morgan told us about the the meeting at which you were removed and the unbelievable, really unbelievable process that that happened there. So there were uh, 70 or 71 members present at the meeting and uh, that they didn't have they, they thought they they misplaced a credential or they thought they had an extra credential or something. And then they found it later on. And, uh, that just, <laughs> there were, you know, it was just, it was so bizarre. And then, and they didn't like the result of the first vote. The first vote would have, uh, kept you there. And so they had a second vote. Um, and why was Shelby Bush at that meeting? That's, that's something that's just bothered me since I, I heard the story. Well, it's uh, they because it was an MCRC bylaw, and the okay. chairman had to, was to call the meeting. Okay. And so the MCRC ran that meeting, mm -hmm. and Shelby's considered you know election integrity, election guru. She ran the election at the county meeting, uh, Maricopa County, excuse me, meeting back in uh, January. Mm. That's probably she was probably running this meeting too. Um, I was not there. My wife had a, a procedure that day that had come up and we needed to have it done. And I needed to stay with her uh, for 24 hours for recovery. Now, did they, this is something that Morgan told me privately. It wasn't um, on the, uh, on the podcast, but he said that they, they knew that your wife had that procedure when they scheduled it. Is that correct? No. Okay. That's not correct. Okay. It, it, uh, it got scheduled. Um, probably not quite a week after the notice went out. Oh, I see. Okay. And it was kind of a, uh, I must you, have, you have to, you have to take advantage of the opportunity. Yeah. Yeah. Because it, was, it could be a serious health issue. Sure. Sure. Yeah. Um, but anyway, so yeah, Shelby, Shelby was in charge of that. And when you talk about the credentialing thing, um, it actually was not a factor. Um, I sent you an audio clip so you could listen to that, but. In the audio clip, Joe Neglia, who was the presider of the meeting, is discussing the the first vote. And prior to his discussing it, there was the uh, chatter about was there 70 or 71 credential. It didn't really matter. And that's what Joe said. When you take the vote, the first vote was 35 in favor of removal, 34 against removal. And there are two people who abstained from voting. So Joe said, well, by he, this is a really long, drawn out method and said that by his determination, the motion failed because there were 71 people who voted 
which means to get a majority, you would have to have 36 in favor of removal. And they only got 35. So it did, it, whether it was 70 or 71 credential was really a point. Then Shelby, as I understand it, Shelby came up and told him abstentions don't count in the in the vote. And, he said, and so he said, oh, oh, they don't count. Okay, okay. And he went on and changed then the vote. The fact is the abstentions do count because the bylaw, the bylaw that um, was uh, that established the, the reason for that meeting included the verbiage say that as to how you determine a majority, which is a majority was determined from the number of PCs present, not the number of PCs voting. So mm -hmm. that's the bylaw. So the, the MCRC, uh, one of my PCs said he challenged that and he was told that he was wrong. And so, so they uh, they just moved on to the next phase of voting. So, so, so there were challenges when I, when I spoke with Shelby briefly over the weekend. She she I asked her about that. You know, you know how how could this this uh, process unfold the way that that Morgan explained it? And, he sa and she said, "Well, you know, nobody nobody challenged it. You know, they could have challenged it then, but nobody challenged it, so everybody was okay with it." They weren't, they just weren't heard. Right. And and if I could add something to that, which I discovered yesterday in Robert's rules, if it's a bylaw, bylaws are, are like, you don't touch them, you can't suspend them, you can't override them with a vote or anything like that. So and what Robert's rules says is you cannot, <clears throat> um, you can go back on a bylaw in which the decision was faulty, essentially, you can go back and do a point of order after the fact. There's no time limit. Doesn't matter how much time has elapsed, as long as that bylaw is still being violated. So, meaning that it's still in violation because Timothy is the chair and I'm not. So, if you interpret that bylaw correctly, he is not in the chair and I am. And they have not. They didn't bring that one up. They said that <clears throat> it's kind of interesting in Robert's rules the section before that one that they cited in their response to us yesterday said that timeliness was required and you had to respond at the time the motion is made they they didn't read further to find this other one that when you have a bylaw you can't i mean bylaws are are important are we going to do the same thing in our legal system and say yeah let's suspend this law because you know we didn't we didn't enforce it we didn't enforce the law when it came to trial so yeah, it's, it's, well, they, they they view the the disruptors everywhere, I and mean, it's amazing how they all have the same hive mind everywhere. The rules do not apply to them; they only apply when they can use it against their opponents, <laughs> and and mm -hmm. it's it is infuriating. Um, Shelley uh, says uh, Timothy literally goes after people who disagree with him. He believes that a person with a different opinion is actually attacking him and going after him. I've seen that from so many as well. They, they claim that somebody who is challenging them is threatening them or attacking them. And you know, it's just, it is really uh, just very juvenile behavior. Um, so I don't know if, if that's something that you, it's, I mean, every everything that you've described so far confirms that. So um, thanks for that, Shelley. Maggie has a question. Maggie Kurzweil says, who do you think is financially behind the GOP disruptors in Arizona? Is that something you'd like to speak to? I, 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 I would have to take a wild guess. I really have no idea who's sure. behind that. I can share what I know, um, which is that Craig Berland is fairly wealthy. Um, and uh, <laughs> so, he, yeah, and um, I, I could share more about that, but he, but he, he is fairly wealthy and that, uh, I believe he has made contributions to MCRC. Um, and uh, Shelby has a PAC, the We the, Mer we the People Arizona Alliance PAC. And the primary, uh, uh, the, the primary donor to that PAC is Patrick Byrne. And the second largest donor to that PAC is the America Project, which is Mike Flynn and Joe Flynn and, and Patrick Byrne. So um, there, that that's, um, and you know that's a documented 
source of funding. That's a documented connection there. There's also, I believe there's, um, there's another, um, I, I'm not sure the name it's, I think I want to say it's like we, the people Alliance LLC or something like that. Um, and I need to research that a little further that, but I, I found that it was actually, um, it was started by someone within TPUSA, within Turning Point, and then granted to her in some way or sold to her or something. But she, uh, Shelby is now in charge of that. So I don't know if there was any financial transaction involved in that or not, um, but there was a connection with Turning Point. Um, Skyla says, this international misinterpretation by Joe and Shelby changed our vote, or intentional, I'm sorry, not international, this intentional misinterpretation. So. Um, so I, I think that, um, because there, there were uh, some votes that were changed in that second vote, right? There were a couple votes that, that might've been changed. So there was, did, can you speak to what Skyla might be talking about there? Yeah, the, that, yeah, in the first vote, there were two abstentions In the second vote, there was only one. And so there was, a. Uh, I even got I even found out yesterday who the the one person was and it was a surprise to me. But anyway, the um belief is that Timothy he goes around and whips the vote. And the belief is that somebody voted wrong the first time. And so he went and had words with them. We um we think we know who it is because somebody saw how this person voted who was sometimes with Timothy and sometimes not. And Timothy was seen talking to that person later on and maybe convinced him to change his vote. Wow. So. Um, wow. So the um, Trump 24 says the behavior always sticks out and is so consistent with what we've experienced in Michigan. Um, wow. And and that's that's exactly right. I mean, this is tomorrow. I am going to, I'm, I'm having my guest tomorrow night is from South Carolina. Uh, he's a he's a journalist there in I believe Charleston, and he's been covering this. And in the conversations that we've had, it completely confirms it's the exact same behavior. I mean, they they use the same kinds of Bible verses, they use the same exact language, and uh, they it, it's um, it, it, they use the same methods. They they it's the Solinsky tactics. They even talk about Solinsky tactics. Uh, so it's the same. It is the same hive mind that they, they censure people, they remove them from the party. We've been seeing that, you know, that this kind of operating almost like a rogue LD, his own rogue LD, and there in Arizona, that's how how many LDs has that happened in where there've been two two LDs kind of operating at the same time? Because, uh, you know, I know Bob Gomez is doing that for a long time in, in LD3. And yeah, and LD3 is an actual, uh, organized kind of a split right. the way that came about but i've heard of another in ld5 they also have a group that meets on their own that's uh, separate from the, the main group right and there's <laughs> similar even in pima county too i don't know um enough of the details to speak to that i just know that there is um that there's a split down there um so yeah, there's there's just there, <laughs> and and that's happened here in I don't even know how many counties it's happened here in Michigan and and it's just in in uh, South Carolina in Greenville County they they actually they have kicked out enough people that they've just gone and formed the people that have been kicked out by the disruptors have formed their own Republican club to do Republican things like getting out the vote and supporting candidates <laughs> because. Yeah because the, the existing party has no interest in doing those things. So yeah. And on that note that that's uh, Timothy had made uh, mocked me in, in emails and in meetings for wanting to do voter registration and other things that PCs normally do. In his mind, the only thing we should do and our number one priority was election integrity. What's and fascinating to me is that I understand that position. I'm I'm not like it's not like I'm anti-election integrity, but he he is the one who is the loudest voice and pushing it the most, but did nothing to promote anything except bring one censure forward that that failed because people were tired of the censures by the time that one came around. 
but he, but he talks the talk but he doesn't do any action mm -hmm. to back up what he's saying and he blames it on me that i did not make it a priority well he was part of the board he didn't really bring it up and say here's a here's a project that i think we should do mm -hmm. I, I did bring up one because it was by mcrc it was a voter roll cleanup project and i was just supporting that and trying to get people on our on our primarily d involved in mm -hmm. working on that. But. yeah um maggie says the split in the arizona lds um in into two factions in the ld is similar to what's going on in kalamazoo kalamazoo county that's happened uh very very you know very much like that um but also hillsdale county uh it happened in macomb county it's it, there's and right now it, there are we we had on march 2nd we had our state convention and there were two districts so you know and there's 83 eight, actually 85 counties in in michigan uh county gops and uh, so there's, you know, the counties are small and the, the districts are large. We have, we have 13 districts. So two of those districts met on their own and claimed to be holding their own conventions during the state district caucuses. And, wow. uh, and, you know, and they held their own vote and, and they claimed that their vote was legitimate. And, you know, so it's, it's, um, and we even had two state parties for two months. We had two state parties yeah. because Christina Karamo was removed. She continued to claim that she was the chair. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, it is, the similarities are pretty stunning. Uh, Skyen says, rhinos will be held accountable by the PCs. Guess what? Did Zarni people show up to the real LD3 meeting to vote for state delegates? Get your facts straight or shut up. You know nothing. Thank you for the example of the type of behavior that you guys like to do, you know, everybody that doesn't agree with you is a rhino and, um, you know, and shut up because our facts are the only right facts, whatever those facts are. Um, so Melanie says, Scott, your hive mind comment. I was listening to a Christian speaker a while ago and she was talking about how demons work. And she said they are hive mind. Their leader tells them to do something and they do their attacks like they're ordered. It's a political podcast, so she related that to how uh, Democrats operate as well. Um, and uh, Trump twenty four says, "Oh, there's a disruptor." <laughs> the, the thing is that they use the, the, this person. So Skyen, she could be she she's in Arizona, obviously, but um, you know she has uh, there there are hundreds of people here in Michigan that speak exactly the same way. And in every other state, they use the same, same type of language, the same type of attacks, you know, this condescending kind of language. Um, so I don't, if there's any sky and if there's anything that, that Forrest has shared or that I have shared that is factually incorrect, I would love for you to correct us. Uh, I'm, I know for myself, I have zero interest in saying anything that is untrue uh, and reporting anything that's untrue. So if there's anything that we've reported here that's factually incorrect, please, um, you know, show us the evidence of that. And I know I would be happy to correct. And, and based on, on the, my experience and, and understanding of forest, uh, you know, that, that uh, I would assume that, that you would like to make sure that you're being factual as well. So, yeah. Um, yeah, yep. so, so, so you have sky in right now, you've got the floor. If you would like to bring anything forward that you feel uh, contradicts, you know, factually what we have shared here. And, um, and we would love to hear that. So, um, and, and anyone else. So, you know, any other questions we have about five more minutes, is there anything else that you want to share Forrest? Yeah. So you had, uh, Skyla Edwards popped up there. She is a candidate for our house of representatives in LD 26. Okay. LD 26 is extremely Democrat, uh, highly 65% Democrat, something like that. Anyway, we haven't had a republic uh, republican candidate in quite a while let alone somebody who was actually our representative so we have three skyla edwards vic harris and uh frank roberts are all running timothy has not been interested in his in supporting skyla in particular because something that she did that he deems was against him so he's not supporting her but unfortunately uh, he doesn't have a say in whether or not the LD endorses her. And he's doing it as the chairman. He's not going to endorse her. 
but we as the LD have the right to endorse, not him. So let him know that. And I, I did have a question. Yeah. Maybe. Is it common in other states for the disruptors to be primarily consisting of newer PCs? Mm. Uh, recruited for that purpose? Yeah. So do you mean the leaders or the followers? Because they are very two very different groups. The followers. Yeah. Uh, yeah. The followers definitely newer or almost exclusively newer um, and, and um, because they've, they've had that kind of information control um, placed upon them from from the beginning. And and also because they don't really have the knowledge and experience um, on how on how the party works and, you know, how, <laughs> you know, that the, they, they have this expectation that everybody's supposed to agree with them on 100 percent of the th stuff. And that's, you know, anybody that's been in the party for any amount of time knows that. Yeah, there, there's always going to be disagreement over stuff. <laughs> you know, you gotta you, you find you find a way to work together. But the ones who follow the disruptor leaders, uh, they they have um, they they don't have that expectation at all. So yeah, that that is yeah. They're they're always they're always newer, and there there are some exceptions, but they're they're more rare. Um, and Joe says, has there has the party been able to raise money? So you know. Um, what is your knowledge and understanding of that? And that, and we're talking about on the district level, the state, the county level, and the state level. On the state level, they were, as I understand it, uh, about to get, receive a bunch of money, and then there was the Jeff Dewitt incident, in which Kerry Lake uh, uh, charged him with. Uh, well, obviously, she charged him with, but she had that recording that suggested he was bribing her not to run for an office and that money dried up my understanding uh, mcrc i i don't know that they have a lot of money they have some i don't know where they're at I haven't seen any financials lately uh, and rld uh so rld uh, uh under the previous chairman uh operated out of a coffee can you might say uh, just uh, taking donations 50 50 raffle donations and using that money and was not organized as an LD in any kind of a structure and did not have a bank account. So we did that last year and we did our first fundraiser. So we don't have a lot of money, but we did get $2,000 to a gun raffle that we did and just completed about a month ago. So not a lot of money there, but uh, it's more than we ever had before. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, on, on, I think to on the state level, because, uh, you know, that's, perhaps what, what Joe might be working towards, you know, on, on the state level, nobody really knows because uh, they had a state meeting, state convention just this last weekend, and there were no financial reports presented. And since I believe uh, in over a year that this person has been, it's Jordan, uh, or is it Jordan or Justin? The, the treasurer? the treasurer? Yeah. Elijah Norton. Elijah, Elijah, Jay, <laughs> Jay's in the middle, not the beginning. Yeah. Elijah Norton um, is the state treasurer, and uh, Elijah has not produced a financial report in over a year. And um, so um, Dan Farley says, Carrie Lake costs our state party approximately 400000 to 500000 when the Trump event got canceled in January. Yeah, so, um, and Carrie, that I, I think what Dan is referring to there is that so Trump had, was scheduled to come out and there, that was going to be a big fundraising event for the state party. And um, when Carrie Lake really you know, released those, uh, that, that the recording that she had of DeWitt and that was, it seemed to have been a pretty orchestrated hit piece on DeWitt. And you know, when, when I have listened to that entire recording a, a few times, and I think if, if you listen to the recording without uh, uh, that she had of DeWitt without having a preconceived opinion of what happened, it, it really feels like a setup. Um, and uh, so as soon as that came out, Trump canceled the event. He says, I'm not going right in the middle of that, which I think is wise. And so, yeah, that certainly did cost the party money. And Trump hasn't been back out since, uh, partly, uh, you know, I, I, I wouldn't guess as to Trump's motives, but. Um, so you know, hopefully he does come back out, and and that that's able to happen. Um, 
but there is the the bottom line is that there there is certainly some financial difficulty and that's the reason why they decided to sell the building um the headquarters building this is last weekend skyla says i was told directly by a disruptor on tape that it is better to burn the republican party down uh Christina Caramo actually said the same thing. <laughs> if it burns down, so be it. She said that in a public meeting. Uh, and she she was the state chair still. <laughs> you know, just unbelievable. Unbelievable, uh, yeah. The the parallels. And I actually heard that from someone else this week here in Michigan. It, you know, if it burns down, so be it. That so this is this is uh the hive mind that I think Melanie was talking about. I think it certainly is spiritual. And I, I plan to write more about that in the future, that this there, there are spiritual components to this, but it's a psychological, it's a very clearly conceived and coordinated psychological operation. And the fact that people are saying the same stuff, I mean, this is, this is crap. To, to say it's better to burn the Republican Party down, like what in the world, especially right now, I mean, we're, we can win. <laughs> we, we have, we have, Nobody likes Joe Biden. <laughs> Nobody likes what they're doing to this country. The Republicans can win. And and yet they're talking and, and they're, he's Trump is leading in so many polls, even even in Arizona this week. He's leading in polls. And people are saying, but it's better to burn the Republican down, the Republican Party down. Like this just that that is there's something seriously wrong there. Dan says circumstantial evidence shows Carrie Lake timed her audio release to help Shelby Bush. Um and uh with jim o'connor or to elect jim o'connor i think might be what he's trying to say and uh and that's something that dan maybe maybe we can come and talk about that or or that's something to definitely explore more in the future uh and i'm actually working on a report about kerry lake and, and mcrc right now uh so you know all, all you disruptors uh you can try to get ahead of that story if you like you don't even know what's going to be in it <laughs> you probably do if you're honest but <laughs> <laughs> it gives no thought to the people that attitude impacts. That's exactly right, Skyla. Um, Jason says, makes you wonder what their motive is. Yes, it does. Uh, you know, certainly judging by their actions, it's not to win in November. And Melanie says, there must be a disruptor school somewhere. <laughs> and, uh, and yes, and, and I... Um, I'll, I'll say it now. Um, I am extremely confident that... Um, General Mike Flynn has something to do with that. So um, as I've been looking at, one thing that I've been looking at here, and this is off topic, but I'll explain it very briefly, is that um, the Reawake, Reawaken America tour thing that he does with Clay Clark, a big part of that is recruiting uh, small podcasters, conservative podcasters, and they have a whole school that they bring people into. It, it would be really easy for me to build my audience through them <laughs> They, because that's what they do. They they build the audience. They have Clay Clark, Clark come on. They have um, Mike Flynn came on. Come on. They'll, they'll they they organize all of these appearances for you with people that will draw your audience. And uh, Patrick Byrne, Tom Renz, all these people that you know that they all will come on your show and <laughs> and build your audience. But you've got to say the right things. And these then, and this is a big part of where this language is coming from, is from the conservative media. And I would say that uh, I, I, somewhere between ninety and ninety-eight percent of the conservative media um, is is on board with this to some extent. I mean, it's at least the small, you know, the independent conservative media. It's it, it's very frustrating. So that's that's my own. It's a complete aside. Um, I'm not representing Forrest with that view. That's this is. Um, research that I've done, but there certainly is a disruptor school. And, um, you know, the, the, these people are being taught this, you know, Brian Ferentz has worked with Timothy. It sounds like Timothy has kind of a pattern in the past of being controlling and manipulative with the PCs. Um, and, uh, you know, he certainly is also, I mean, would you say that he's been emboldened by uh, Ferentz? And do you think that uh, Brian Francis kind of helped to embolden him and and because he you said that he considers him a friend and I would say both Brian and Liz Harris yeah have been very influential in in backing him up to right uh, I think because they they knew him before they knew it know what he's capable of they know that he will do anything and say anything to grab power 
And that's been kind of what I have witnessed in the past year. They like people like that. Yeah. So for us, this has been just a, a joy. Um, I really appreciate your, your, uh, I, I can tell that you've, uh, you've been a humble servant leader of your, uh, LD and, um, uh, and, and I'm, it sounds like, and I, I would imagine that you've been missed and, um, and I, I, uh, I hope that, that you're able to return to that role in some fashion or it, at the very least to, to continue to be involved in, um, helping the, the Republican Party to create victory in Arizona in November. And we here in Michigan want to help you in any way that we can. Um, right. Not just speaking for myself. So this is this is to everyone in Arizona, um, you know, anything that we can do to help. Um, you know, I've, I've heard that from many people here um, and I certainly want to. So um, well, that's sure. we have not stopped. I haven't stopped. We're still working. Uh, right. there, we have a faithful group of PCs that they want to win elections, and we're that's what we're doing. Despite what anybody else is doing, we're we're trying to do that. Mm -hmm. so. um, very good. Well, um, so if are there any parting parting words or any last thoughts that you'd like to share? Uh, just one. I had this comment made to me twice last year. Mm. Uh, when when uh, <clears throat> something was going against me, and uh, Timothy came up, to, came up to me, he handed me a piece of paper, and he said, this isn't personal, but it has to be done. So I'd like to say that this broadcast wasn't personal, but it had to be done. And I'm glad I was here with you, Scott, to do it. You had a lot of background and information that, uh, that I didn't have, and, and I appreciate what you're doing for everybody in this country great well yeah you're 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 very welcome i'm just happy to be used in this way so um until next time thank you very much for joining us and there will be next time very soon so thank you all right bye-bye bye, -bye. bye.